There's something very powerful about that amen. It's a Hebrew word. This is fascinating to me. Just a real, real quick lesson, I'm, I'm closing. It's a Hebrew word, amon, transliterated into English, amen. And it, it literally, for the Hebrews, was to, to confirm or to establish or to support. It was confirmation when you tacked on the amen. In, in Isaiah 65, it's the name of God. Isaiah 65, 16 says, He is the God of truth. But the word truth in the Hebrew is amen. The translators thought it looked weird to say, He is, God is amen. So they put God is truth because it's an alternate version of the word amen. I wish they had left it alone. You know why I really wish they had left it alone is because when you get to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, Jesus is defined as the amen. So there's God as the amen in Isaiah 65. There's Jesus as the amen in Revelation 3. That would have been another biblical confirmation that the amen of the Old Testament is the amen of the New Testament, that the father of the old is the, fa is the son of the new, and that they are one. And when you receive Jesus, you are receiving the father. You are literally, when you put your amen on it, you're agreeing with God. That's God's name is the amen. It's who he is. And so we, we, we tacked that on. And, and through history, we, we tried to change it. And it didn't have the veracity. In fact, second generation Christian writings, we're talking late first century, early second century, post New Testament text. Gentile writers start to enter the fray. Most of our New Testament writers are Jewish, first generation. They're Jewish, they received Jesus as their Messiah. Most of our second generation writings didn't make the canon. They were being written by Gentile writers. Doesn't mean they're not worth looking at. But they're being written by people who were the former strangers, former aliens, former Romans, former barbarians. But they're coming to Jesus in their writing and they tried to, they tried to sort of Hellenize a lot of the Hebrew language. And so for a long time, you'll read in that second generation of early second century writings, they would use the Greek word eleuthinos for amen whenever they would end their prayers. It's the Greek word eleuthinos. But eleuthinos, the problem is, is that it literally means that which is not false. And they found that there was no force behind that which is not false. There's a better way to claim the promises of God than go, well, he's not wrong. <laughs> So it's a fascinating study in scholarship to watch Eleuthanos vanish from their writings. It's like they tried it and went, you know, we got to be a little more confirmed in our spirit than, well, he's not wrong. You know, that's not. And it's fascinating because Eleuthanos vanishes like mid-second century. You don't see them using that word anymore. And they were trying to come up with a more Hellenized term than the word that was used. The, Sept the Septuagint is a... Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Seventy Hebrew scholars sat in a room and translated the Hebrew into Greek. Can you imagine how that didn't go over in its day? We freak out every time somebody comes out with a new translation now because, oh, it's impure. Can you imagine taking the original Hebrew and putting it into Greek? Did you know that your New Testament writers did not read the Old Testament in Hebrew? They read the Old Testament in Greek. In other words, they read a second generation version of the Old Testament. And it's why in your old English, King James, New King James, this is just Bible study time, right? This is just fun Bible study time to me. Uh, in your old King James, whenever you read the New Testament and they quote the Old Testament and then you go look it up in the Old Testament, it doesn't read the same. And you go, why'd they change the words? They didn't change the words. They were quoting the Greek. Your Old Testament was written out of the Hebrew. And so that's why the wording's different. So you don't look at it and go, oh, see, the Bible's got, there's an error. What they're doing is reading a different translation than we were reading. The interesting thing is when they translated the Old Testament into Greek, called the Septuagint, the Septuagint literally used the Greek word genoito for amen. They didn't use the Hebrew because they weren't allowed to write Hebrew in it. They were only writing Greek. So they used an old, like Aristotle, Plato, Socrates word that was as close as they could get in that Old Testament world to amen, genoito. And... Genoito literally in the Greek means, would that it were so. Oh, no. <laughs> would that it were so. So you've got whole generations of people trying to figure out how to grab hold of 
And the best the mind of man can come up with is, would that it were so, and, well, at least it's not wrong. <laughs> and by the late second, third century, the church starts to s- sort of build itself around common terminology. They give up. And they go, let's go back to the original. Seems like it works. Amen. And it is one of the remaining Hebrew words that shows up in your English Bible. Translated straight out of Hebrew. Amen. And it has made it all the way over into English. Now for us, it's kind of, we get to eat. (laughs) Or, yep, prayer's done, let's go. And it should, and I think we need a revival like the Septuagint audience had and like the second generation Gentiles had, where we realize our amen isn't enough. That there's not enough force behind it. And so we need a revival of, so be it unto me. It's not, at least it's, you know, maybe it'll be, or, well, at least it's not false. No, it's, yes, that's mine. Why? Because Jesus said so. My amen is on the back of his yes. Jesus said, yes, I say amen. God said you can have it, I say it's mine. Amen. And I think if we'll start to grab it with our amen, we'll start to realize our promises. What's the end game of getting our promises? Wallering around in them and enjoying them. No. The end game of getting our promises is we ought to turn that promise over to someone else and go, here, I'm going to charge you what I was charged. You can have this. Forgiven. Loved. Beautiful in the eyes of the Father. Take it, receive it, know it. I love where the church is in this hour. I think it's quite an hour. It's an hour to shine. It's an hour to look like something totally different than what politics, both sides of the aisle, are handing us. It's an hour to look different than what we're seeing on the news. It's an hour to look different than even what we grew up in in the church. It's an hour we get to shine and show people the love of the Father and put ourselves aside and say, I owe it to my neighbor. Let me show you what God did for me. And let me charge you the same thing he charged me.